here is our recurrence. We have a, a recurrence for p of n and m in terms of p of n minus 1 and m and p of n and n minus 1. We have certain boundary conditions. Now, this gives us a two-dimensional array of values p and m. The boundaries are specified for us. So here's what we have. Axes n and m, starting at the origin and increasing through positive integers. The boundary conditions tell us that along the, the y-axis, the probabilities are 0 because m exceeds n. Along the x-axis, for positive n, the probability is 1 because if Bob gets no votes, Jane always leads. And in fact, everywhere along a diagonal, a 45 degree diagonal, the probabilities are 0. So everything at a diagonal and above, you have 0 probability. Right? These are what the boundary conditions give us. Now, what about the rest of the values? Okay, of course, this is the million dollar question. So what if n is 6 and m is 4? We want p of 6, 4. This was our original problem. Or a modified problem. What if n is 51 and m is 49? Well, that's somewhere in that wedge out there. And that's what we want to determine. What does the recurrence tell us? The recurrence tells us that if we want to look at a particular n and m value, the probability of p and m is determined by two other probabilities. A p-value directly below it, corresponding to n and m minus 1, a p-value to its left, corresponding to n minus 1 and m. If I know these two p-values, call them earlier p-values, together they allow us to deduce our target p-value through a process of aggregation. Okay. This means that we build up everything in that wedge via this recurrence. Well, let's build up some idea of how we are going to do this. Right? So let's start with the simplest non-trivial case. Let's look at the case where n is 2 and m is 1. That's the little gray triangle we are looking at. The values south of and west of the desired value 2, 1 will inform the value at 2, 1. Let's put it together. Well, we know the values to the south and to the west. They are given by the boundary conditions. Throw them into our relationship, and out comes an answer. Oh, beautiful. Now, the chance of Jane leading Bob every step of the way, when she gets two votes and Bob gets one vote, is one in three. Now, this is so simple that you can work out all possible arrangements and verify this for yourself. All right, very good. Well, what about the next step? Well, what can we say if Jane gets three votes and Bob gets one vote? Well, we build it up again from the point south and west of 3, 1. South of 3, 1 is a value 3, 0, which is certain. West of 3, 1 is a value corresponding to 2, 1, but we've just calculated this probability. We plug it in, we evaluate it, and we find it's 2 and 4. Curiouser and curiouser, as Alice remarked. If you look at the next value, n is 4 and Bob is 1, and, and uh, m is 1. Again, the values south and west of these values will inform the target value. We plug it in, and we find it's 3 and 5. This looks quite beguiling. In fact, as we progress along the line m equal to 1, it looks like the probabilities are increasing like n minus 1 over n plus 1. That's very interesting. Now, let's try a different value for m, say m equal to 2. What if n is 3 and m is 2? Again, the point south is n is 3 and m is 1. Oh, but we know this value. The point to the west is n is 2 and m is 2. Oh, but we know this value as well. Plug it in, and we now have a new probability, 1 and 5. What about the point 4, 2? Jane gets 4 votes, Bob gets 2 votes. Pro go through the same process, we now find it's 2 in 6. 
Now we can see we have a systematic process. We can populate for any m value all values for n, then keep doing this until we fill up everything in that wedge going on as far as we need to. And if we do that, we end up with this array of values. Now, at least at this level, we have a numerical method of getting to any n m value. In particular, we can read off the probability p of 6,4 in your screen will tell you 6,4 has a chance of 2 in 10 or 1 in 5. There's a 20% chance that in the original problem, Jane will lead Bob every step of the way. She gets 6 votes, Bob gets 4 votes. What about 51,49? Well, we're going to have to go far enough along this wedge till we get to 51,49. But it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we had an explicit formula for what p of n m is. Now, if you look at this and stare at it long enough, you will see a pattern emerging. Okay? And the pattern gives you a conjecture for what the answer might be. p of n m appears to take a particularly simple and beguiling form. The ratio of n minus m to n plus m when n is bigger than m. Of course, one shouldn't believe a formula just because it appears on screen or in a book. Right? One should verify it to make sure we believe the structure. Right? So let's take a look at how we might verify this. Here is a projected or putative answer. P of n, comma m is n minus m over n plus m. And there's a recurrence that P of n, comma m needs to satisfy. To verify it, let us see if the left-hand side is in fact equal to the right-hand side. On the left, I have n and m in play. On the right, I have two terms, one involving n minus 1 and m, and one involving n and m minus 1. If our formula is valid, we plug in and we get fractions. Simplify and verify we have an identity. And we do have a solution, and a particularly simple and elegant one at that. If in a two-party election, one candidate gets n votes and the other gets m votes and n is bigger than m, the chance of the winning candidate leading at every step of the way is n minus m over n plus m. We could hardly have hoped for a simpler or cleaner answer. And against the odds, out of this very complicated looking structure, emerges a rose of an answer, a beautiful, elegant answer. What about the case when Jane got 51% of the vote and Bob got 49% of the vote? Notice, as long as Jane gets 51% and Bob gets 49%, the actual numbers n and m don't matter. It's only their relative proportions that matter. And so whatever the size of the population, imagine, let's say, a vote in the US state of Florida, with, say, approximately 6 million voters. If Jane gets 51% of the vote and Bob gets 49% of the vote, well, it's a very large number. Jane and Bob are, Bob are both getting approximately 3 million votes apiece. The chance of Jane leading every step of the way is, in fact, 51 minus 49 divided by 51 plus 49. In other words, there is fully a 2% chance that Jane leads Bob every step of the way. Now, chance in commonplace settings tends to mean different things to different people. So at some level, people might look at 2% and say, well, that's a small number. But if you think of it in the context of 6 million voters, each of the candidates getting approximately half the votes, votes are in random order, that one candidate actually led the other candidate every step of the way. That seems to feel unnatural. It doesn't feel right. right? Or to put it in context, if in 50 states in a country, the 50 states of the United States, for example, you had contentious elections where one party led the other by 51 to 49 in each of the 50 states. In many of the states, of course, the running count would go all, all directions, ultimately with one party triumphing. But on average, in one out of those 50 states, perhaps the unhappy state of Florida, you might have a candidate leading 
over 6 million counted votes, where she gets half of them approximately. She leads at every step of the way. For many people, you might find this is startling. Okay. And this is again illustrative of the fact that chance has got unexpected wells of possibility, places where intuition is not sufficient to get at the underlying ground truth. For our purposes here, this example, the ballot problem of W.A. Whitworth, illustrates how additivity and conditioning on a carefully chosen ancillary event can unlock an apparently intractable and difficult problem, subtle and nuanced. The difficulty was not in the utilization of the formula. The formula is as simple as can be. It's just a chain of conditional probabilities. The difficulty in this problem is identifying the appropriate underlying ancillary event, which partitions the space and peels out what the individual pieces are. This problem is not just for fun, uh, not just for illustrative purposes, but it turns out to have deep consequences. Right? A, an eventual descendant of this line of thought leads to questions about where random walks move. They lead to questions in what is now called Martingale theory. And the understanding of simple problems like this leads then to profound new results in new directions of endeavor.